Balaji for his presentation on conservative management Traco Bronco Malaysia. He is a pediatric pulmonologist from ICU Chekmore. He is in charge of primary pulmonary immunodeficiency and tuberculosis center of excellence, Tamil Nadu. Good morning everyone. <coughs> I am Dr. Sharad Balaji from Institute of Child Health Chennai. Feeling honored to be here but at the same time feeling as an odd man out because Almost most of you are surgeons, almost only three people of us are pediatricians here. <clears throat> and I don't know what to talk about conservative management of tracheobronchomalacia here. Uh, so let me try my level best. Okay. <clears throat> so going to cover what is a yeah, simple bird's eye view on tracheobronchomalacia. Since I don't have much thing to say regarding the conservative management, let's have a simple bird's eye view from a clinician's perspective. <clears throat> we all know that tracheum bronchomalacia is nothing but a yeah, collapsibility, exaggerated collapsibility of trachea during breathing. Either it can involve your cartilaginous part or it can involve your membranous part. Both can occur. It can be a generalized one. In case of some syndromic mucopolysaccharidosis, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, Marfan syndrome, etc., or it can be a segmental if it is associated with a primary cartilaginous defect. It can be intrathoracic or extra extrathoracic, and as we said before, it can be primary involving your cartilaginous part, or secondary due to some extra luminal things. When we go to primary or congenital, it can involve your cartilage. And uh, if it is diffuse, it can be due to these things. Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, Marfan, Echondroplasia, most of them are being treated as difficult visors. And uh, because of prolonged PEEP, prolonged CPAP, prolonged non-invasive ventilation, that too impinges much of pressure to the developing trachea, leading on to so many cases of tracheomalacia in cases survivors of bronchopulmonary dysplasia. And it is, it can very well said that Cases of tracheoesophageal fistula will be associated with then tracheomalacia. Syndromes, as we said, these syndromes such as charge vatar, mucopolysaccharidosis, downs are associated with that. Secondary, majority of them we are seeing vascular rings, links. We are living in an era of antenatal ultrasound in which we have been seeing many cases of tracheomal secondary tracheomalacia due to anomalous aberrant right or left subclavian artery along with the double aortic arch or an innominate artery compression. Skeletal abnormalities, severe pecta, pectus excavatum or scoliosis and uh, long-standing intraluminal infections. It doesn't mean that your tracheomalacia can lead to bronchiectasis. Even a bronchiectasis secondarily can lead to infection, inflammation and damage to the trachea can lead on to this tracheomalacia in future. Button batter ingestion, a very well known uh, entity. Medical procedures involving, it must be known more to you rather than me. And uh, extra luminal compression either in the form of a neuroblastoma or T-cell ALL or even we have seen one cases of mediastinal lipoma causing tracheomalacia. But in the recent past, in the two years, our cohort of tracheomalacia mainly includes vascular ring that too double aortic arch and aberrant left subclavian artery compared to primary tracheomalacia that we have been seeing in the past decade. For the past three years, we are seeing more of secondary tracheomalacias due to vascular rings and slings. And uh, because on many cases of post-operative tracheomalacia following a TEF repair. This is our cohort we see in ICH. And most often, the diagnosis of tracheomalacia is delayed or misdiagnosed. Most of them are diagnosed as a case of laryngomalacia. From a clinician point of view, whenever we see a case of strider, majority of them will diagnose as it a case of laryngomalacia unless otherwise it is associated with some failure to thrive. But how to differentiate from a clinician's perspective? Whether it is laryngomalacia or tracheomalacia, we all know that laryngomalacia involves the softening of the larynx and the, they don't involve much of the cough receptors. As a result of which any strider without any involvement of cough or uh, wheeze will be more in favor of laryngomalacia. And the onset of laryngomalacia will usually be more than one week or 10 days of age. 
that's why whenever we see any case of strider along with significant cough along with strider whenever see we see any case of significant cough that to a metallic cough that to the onset less than one year of age we will tend to do fiber optic bronchoscopy to look for tracheobronchomalacias and we yes it is a well known fact that majority of them are misdiagnosed as asthma and uh, sometimes they will worsen after giving a uh, beta to agonist or a bronchodilator but as far as the difference between an asthma and a child with tracheobronchomalacia is mainly uh, the children with tracheobronchomalacia are mainly called as happy wheezers and uh, predominantly it is a monophonic wheeze and it is often heard in the central than in the peripheral whereas in case of asthma we have more a polyphonic wheeze and distributed throughout the chest rather than over the central area and we have been seeing many 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 cases of tracheomalacia being presented as a recurrent croup whenever they get any viral infection they often get admitted with the altb like a presentation and the metallic cough is a classical character and because of the approximation of the anterior and posterior wall there will be delayed clearance of infection delayed clearance of secretion leading to delayed resolution of a simple viral cough and cold sometimes because of severity particularly if it involves more than 90% it can lead on to life threatening cyanotic or dying spells and it can also lead to feeding difficulties and uh, it has been a, a fact that has been observing over the past one decade almost 15 to 50 percentage of protracted bacterial bronchitis patients have an associated either tracheomalacia and bronchomalacia and which when get untreated can lead on to chronic separative lung disease such as bronchiectasis so this is a typical metallic cough i think the sound is not audible leave it x ray is it possible to identify a tracheobronchomalacia in an x ray practically it is very 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 difficult to get such an x ray in a child to have an inspiratory and expiratory film but at times we can try but majority of the time it is unlikely to have a positive result with respect to x ray to diagnose a case of tracheobronchomalacia and when you have doubt is it possible to do a infant pulmonary function test yes it is possible it can be used as a screening test if you have uh, the setup to do an infant uh, pulmonary function test the one on the left has got, has a good uh, expiratory limb but one on the right has got a flat expiratory limb so whenever we have that kind of flat expiratory limb we can consider an underlying tracheomalacia inside and uh, what about the ct scan so the ct scan yes uh, whenever uh, uh, parents are not willing for fiber optic bronchoscopy either we can uh, use this multi director ct scan or virtual bronchoscopy to look for that exaggerated collapse of the trachea during expiration but here we don't use ct scan much and we mostly rely on dynamic bronchoscopy and mri it has been an evolving procedure and uh, it is nothing but a cini mri the good thing about this there is no radiation exposure but the thing is we have limited publications in future i don't know whether that will replace your bronchoscopy or not but as far as the investigation of choice is concerned right now for all tracheobronchomalacias in our center we do only dynamic airway endoscopy we don't anesthetize the child we just uh, do spray and proceed technique with uh, lignocaine and uh, it should be done under a spontaneous breathing to look for an exaggerated collapse during expiration and as we said trachea should be observed for collapse during expiration and uh, do in a bronchoscopy under uh, direct view we will see whether it is a static tracheomalacia or a dynamic tracheomalacia a dynamic tracheomalacia which often be due to an intrinsic cartilaginous defect whereas a static we will see whether it is a pulsatile or non pulsatile pulsatile more often a ring it can be either a aberrant left or right subclavian artery more a left aberrant left subclavian artery a double aortic arch whenever we see any non pulsatile static mass it is more often any mediastinal lipomas or mediastinal neuroblastomas or t cell leukemias or lymphomas
So the one on the left is quite pulsatile. Turned out to be a case of double aortic arch. Look at the pulsatility on the anterior wall of the trachea. Turned out to be a double aortic arch. And one on the right side is not pulsatile. Turned out to be a primary tracheomalacia without any extra luminal involvement. And it is a localized one. So as far as the bronchoscopist is concerned, it is a simple subjective visual estimation by the bronchoscopist. When you have more than 25% compression of the toe cross-sectional area during expiration, a reduction of more than 25% is turned out to be significant. But majority of them will be symptomatic only after 50% of uh, reduction in the expiration in the total cross-sectional area. And based on the extra luminal based on the compression it can be classified as mild moderate or severe 50 to 75 75 to 90 or more than 90 it is quite an arbitrary classification it doesn't mean that it is directly proportional to the symptoms involved really is there any medical management majority of these tracheomalacias unless otherwise there is no extra luminal involvement are self-limiting a yeah, localized tracheomalacia are self-limiting. Is there any role of proven therapy in medical management? So far, none. If at all we want to discuss something regarding the medical therapies, so what are all the therapies we can try? In case if the child is symptomatic with the significant tracheal cough, significant infection, significant recurrent wheeze. Beta 2 agonist so often helps in diagnosing cases rather than treating the cases. By reducing the tone of the trachea, it often leads to increase in V's and increase in the respiratory distress. So often people consider whenever any child less than 6 months comes with the V's and on using beta 2 agonist such as albutamol in India, when it gets worsened, we need to think in terms of an underlying tracheobronchomalacia. But as far as Indian studies are concerned, one from Ames, which says that almost all cases of tracheobronchomalacia, one which is associated with the central airway collapse are definitely associated with some sort of reflex and the prevalence of reflex in almost all cases which involves moderate to severe collapse and uh, anti-reflex should be considered in these cases. And as we discussed already, protracted bacterial bronchitis, even though a new entity in the past 7 to 8 years, the most often associated condition that causes protracted bacterial bronchitis is your tracheobronchomalacia. And we all know that the criteria to consider protracted bacterial bronchitis is a wet cough lasting for more than 4 weeks. But as far as in children with a known tracheobronchomalacia, the cutoff should be reduced. It doesn't mean that you need to wait for four weeks of wet cough to appear. But at the same time, is there any paper to consider how many days of wet cough you need to consider an antibiotic in a known case of tracheobronchomalacia? But it, it, but it is said that you need to lower the threshold for using antibiotics in children with the known tracheobronchomalacia whenever they get worsened. We need to use liberal antibiotics. Prophylactic azithromycin, it is purely anecdotal. Some says that using prophylactic azithromycin does reduce the incidence of uh, PBB. But again, it is anecdotal. We don't have any RCTs to say further. Iprotromia bromide, again, we all know that we, we, we this is the only drug that we use whenever children with the tracheobronchomalacia comes with V's. Whether it reduce, increases the tone or whether it reduces the secretion, we really don't know. But in a study out of 52-32, had showed some kind of improvement with the Ipravent. Mucoactive agents, yes, again, nebulized hypertonic saline has does some role. Again, it is anecdotal. There has been extensive papers on nebulized recombinant DNAs, but these papers did not show any enhanced recovery when they use this costly drug, nor did they reduce the need for an antibiotic. So again, with respect to mucoactic agents, if at all we can try, we can try nebulized hypotonic saline. Some papers have supported the role of it. Muscarinic agents, we don't use, we don't have, and it acts by increasing the tone of the posterior trachealis. But again, uh, we don't have all those things to say our personal experience with respect to these drugs. 
So beyond <coughs> this one, when we need to intervene, whenever any child with tracheobronchomalacia comes with an apneic spill, recurrent PBB, going for bronchiectasis or CSLD, or child with apneic spills or failure to thrive, we need to intervene. The only non-invasive intervention that we can do is CPAP. We all know that particularly when we have tracheobronchomalacias which involves your intrathoracic trachea rather than extrathoracic trachea, this will be the uh, good aid before planning for any surgery if at all it is required. Prognosis, almost majority of the cartilaginous tracheomalacia resolves between 18 months to 2 years. In our cohort also this has been happening. But at times after they grown up, some develop exercise intolerance and these may persist during exercise. Secondary tracheomalacias may take few months. How long? We really don't know. After removal of that compression. So to say from a pediatrician perspective, I can say only three things with respect to the medical management of tracheobronchomalacia. Avoid salbutamol, it will worsen the wheeze. Reduce threshold for antibiotics to consider protracted bacterial bronchitis. And you need to consider anti-reflex measures to reduce the ongoing damage due to vicious circle. That's all from my side. Thank you. Thank you, sir.